And now to the session. It's on the business of film technology, from VFX to the quiet revolution that is happening in distribution technologies to producing content for VR. And we have some very key speakers. We have Ankur Jain, the Vice President of Sales and Business Development at Prime Focus Technologies. May I please request you to come up? And uh, Mr. Sandy Kumar, co-founder of Cube Cinema Technologies. And Arnaud, Arnaud Labaron, did I get your name right? Filmmaker and artistic guide from Wanda VR. We've done this workshop in collaboration with the Institute for Say and Wanda VR. And navigating us through this entire session is Vivek Paul, the CEO of Remark. Over to you, Jeff. Good evening, good afternoon, everyone. We've got a wonderful panel here, you know, people who are definitely leading the technology front in India right now. Let's start with Ankur. I'm good from Human Stuff with a brief introduction. Yeah. Uh, hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ankur Jain. Uh, I head the business for Prime Focus for Asia Pacific. Uh, I'll give you a little brief about uh, the company after the uh, introduction from all of us. Hi, I am uh, Arnaud Abaran from Paris. I am a film producer and film director and I'm working both in standard cinema and in virtual reality, especially 360 degree videos. Hi, I'm uh, Sethil Kumar from uh, Cube Cinema. I'm one of the founders of the company. I, uh, Cube Cinema is in the technology of uh, digital cinema from uh, creation of uh, the content pack digital cinema packages to uh, distribution to exhibition and uh, I think today what we're going to cover in my uh, presentation is about distribution and how it's evolved. Okay. Great, so how could you like to start with the presentation? Can you have the first video please? Thank <laughs> you. 
On the right side is the script, right? Now today, most of us, you know, do scripting on multiple tools and then email it to someone for review. Or we use WhatsApp to, to get uh, parts of the scripts we do. But here, this is a WhatsApp-like interface. <coughs> the script is now um, divided as per the screen page. And each part or each line of this particular script can be commented, reviewed, or some action can be taken. Let's look at the one which is highlighted in yellow. So there it says, Anil, start speaking stuff again. So that means that there is a part in the scene where Anil has to do something with the uh, picking. So if I go down further, I'm able to now assign props to this particular action. So which means that, you know, there's a drawing, there's a Bluetooth, there's a, you know, so there are a lot of things which are now associated with the picking part. Right? So within the script, I have been able to now go and tag a prop list to it. After I have decided what props I need, I may procure the props or I will just source the props in some way. So that part is now being highlighted. So and on a dashboard level, uh, you, you are able to now get a snapshot of what's the status of my props. After that, you can now decide. So on the right side is task breakdown further where you can go into little more detailing of that particular task. But so far what you've seen is, from a script, I've been able to link it to a prop, and, and I've been able to control the entire script, the review, the approval, the prop list, and who's going to do the job. And the best part is, I have the status of this on my mobile. Then we go to the scheduling part with you. Just one single snapshot and we know the schedule of what's the, what's the day looking like. And then, screen by screen, uh, scene by scene, I'm able to understand that what's the status of my shoot or how's the schedule looking like. And, and if you look at the right side, it just gives a feedback of that particular shot. So this is like a dailies management where, you know, depending on how the shooter is, you are now able to control the feedback on that particular dailies itself. And you know your your reviewing team might be sitting offline, but the shoot might be going somewhere uh, in, at a far distance. But you are able to kind of communicate with each other. After you've done that, then your shooting schedule. So you decide on how the shooting schedule is looking like. One single dashboard, and you are able to now see where are you on the shooting side. You know simple things like you know managing lunch for the crew who's shooting. How many people are going to come on board? You know as in the crew giving the last minute order, because all these are costs. And if you are able to have a handle on this, you are able to have your you know, shooting budget in control. And reshoots can be avoided, you are able to give the feedbacks instantly. So all these are areas of optimization. Finally, uh, most of us you know, use WhatsApp to collaborate. We go off the uh, you know, main screen uh, and we kind of communicate with each other. Many times, we pass feedbacks from the shooting flow to the production. And these feedbacks are just lost because you know no one is capturing them, no one is recording them. They are written on some piece of paper, and those papers are not not being uh, documented. So. so everything now is within the app. So no one needs to go to WhatsApp. They just are in the app. It's a WhatsApp-like interface, and everyone is communicating to each other about the feedbacks from the shooting flow to the production and back and forth. Right. <clears throat> so just a few screenshots. From a point of view of how we optimize this, this is just one example. So from a production point of view, we are able to now give you a complete dashboard, complete control on how the production uh, part will work. Finally, uh, just to be on the analytics, look at this. Uh, so basis all the episodes, now basis the content consumption patterns, we are now able to pull out some trends and give a feedback to the content creation and say, hey, you know, probably these scenes can be modified or tweaked. Uh, basis the, con the audience uh, reaction to the scenes. There's a lot of content analytics there. I'm not going to go into too much detail. The idea was just to give you a quick glimpse of you know how technology can help uh, the audience here and also this production process. But yeah, I think in summary, um, our attempt is to uh, use technology to bring efficiencies to the process, to the workflows which are doing. Uh, just one last point here. So today. Uh, like we heard in the last session also, everyone is trying to monetize. One way of monetizing is to send the content to a Netflix, to an Apple, to a YouTube. Right? It's not easy. Because you know there are multiple formats, multiple ways of packaging it. All this you can do at a click of a button. 
and with such platforms, and I'm sure uh, Sindhil will talk about his platform as well. Uh, you know, there are technologies available out there in the market which you can use to uh, do this process fairly simply. So my request to this audience is, uh, you know, to be a little more uh, technology aware, and and there is enough and more help available. It's a bit of you know awareness which is required, but uh, you can use such tools to kind of you know help ease out the overall process which you go through. Right? Thank you. Would you like to share your views on? You can go ahead. So I was going to talk about uh, distribution of movies and how it's uh, evolved and some of the newer trends that are coming along. I think we're a little short of time, so I'm going to rush through some of the uh, stuff, but uh, I'll be around if uh, you want to catch up later. So once upon a time, distribution was easy when we had film prints. We just, uh, we had to lock the movie weeks before release because you couldn't uh, physically transport things any faster. But unfortunately, times have changed and once you move to digital, things have uh, become far easier to do and therefore work has expanded to fill that gap. I think some of us here might be old enough to remember the times when we had so much confusion with film prints and three audio formats. You had uh, Dolby Digital, DTS and SDDS and Dolby Stereo and uh, Mono and theatres that had different formats, the wrong prints going to the wrong places and all of that. But that was still far easier than it is today. Today, when you have digital cinema packages, the very, uh, the easiest way to tell you how complex things have become is to show you how you have the name of a DCP with uh, about 20 different parameters, each of which uh, has uh, 10 variations. So you can imagine how many types of DCPs are there. There's DCPs for uh, uh, two aspect ratios, there's uh, DCPs for uh, multiple sound formats, there's 7.1, 5.1, Atmos, uh, Oru. Then there's uh, DCPs with uh, 10 different uh, subtitling languages, different language versions for different parts of the world, different localizations for uh, each territory because you've got uh, certification or censorship in different parts of the world, all of that. So today it's complete hell behind the scenes. Though when you go to a cinema to watch a movie, hopefully you don't see any of that confusion. But uh, till a movie releases and uh, the first shows play, it's complete hell. Uh, that's something that we can see every Thursday or uh, even Friday in our office uh, with uh, hundreds of versions and KDMs going out, theaters changing their equipment and all of that. So uh, we were speaking to Deluxe to get, uh, they being one of the largest uh, digital labs in the world, we were uh, talking to them to see what uh, quantity of their deliveries was and this is what uh, the answer was. 65 million KDMs in a year. That's because there are so many versions going to so many screens. So Digital Cinema originally promised us a saving in cost, better speed of delivery and flexibility and simplicity. And let's see what we've delivered now. Yes, costs have come down quite a lot with electronic delivery. But uh, there is this virtual print fee that funds some of the equipment that goes into cinemas, but that's something that will eventually go away. So the cost is clearly an advantage that digital has brought. The speed of delivery is again something that uh, digital really has uh, helped enormously in, but as I said, the work has expanded to fill that gap. And filmmakers now believe that they should be able to make changes uh, right until the day of release. So there's one problem that you have to quality check every single version of a movie and that's the one uh, roadblock to making changes even until the very last minute. 
and we touched upon versions already, so I won't uh, go into that in detail now. <coughs> if you talk about simplicity, there's nobody in the industry who will say that uh, there is simplicity today. It's become incredibly difficult to manage behind the scenes. So you have multiple ways of delivery today. You have satellite delivery where everybody gets everything. It's a beam. Uh, we do that for a lot of uh, movies in India. Uh, you have companies. Uh, you have a company called the Digital Cinema Distribution Coalition that does that in the U.S. and all of that. So. Uh, <coughs> That's one method of delivery. Then you have uh, um, what's called OTT delivery, which is uh, internet-based or uh, data line-based delivery. And that's really the way where that the world is moving to, apart from satellite. You have uh, companies that have been doing this uh, across the world. And because of that kind of delivery, you have a method of a pull model, where you can actually choose the movie that you want and get that uh, delivered to the theatre. And there are a number of companies that have uh, pioneered this model. One pretty uh, important among those is uh, Tug, which lets you create, uh, and I think PVR has replicated that here in a system called Macau, where you can actually have the audiences choose the movie that they want to see in the theatre, schedule the show, and have that delivered. Though currently, uh, all of these processes are done manually. Though CubeWire, which uh, we are uh, launching commercially from uh, this year, is uh, being used by Tug. So let me just quickly skip ahead because we are short on time to how uh, CubeWire itself works. You have the CubeWire Cloud and you can upload your content using the CubeWire desktop application. You just drag and drop the DCT that you've created uh, either in your digital cinema lab or yourself on your computer and it uploads, uh, it's very resilient, you can uh, lose your connection, you can get your connection back, it will use all of the bandwidth that you have to upload as quickly as it can into the cloud. The content integrity is checked before and after you upload, so you can rest assured that if it's uploaded into CubeWire, it is perfect. Uh, and you also have the ability to encrypt when you upload. And that's one of the most important things that independent filmmakers fail to <coughs> do because of the complexity. They fail to encrypt their movie and protect their IP. It's uh, something that CubeWire lets you do with utter simplicity. Once you've uploaded it into the cloud, it can uh, go to any part of the world using a uh, peer-to-peer model. And you simply have a web-based interface where you select which theaters in the world that you want to go to and it will get delivered into those theaters. It's as simple as that. You choose the date that you want it delivered and you can get it over there. QBI will tell you the cost of delivery and it has multiple modes of delivery. It can deliver completely online to connected theatres. It can deliver using partner networks where partners have a connection to the theatre. It can deliver over a satellite network where a partner has a satellite network delivery to the theatre. And it can also deliver by hard drives using uh, partners who have an automated appliance that will integrity check the content, it will make a copy on the hard drive, again check the integrity of the hard drive uh, and track that hard drive right up to the data. If there are exceptions of uh, failure to deliver, it will also give our support team the information and ensure that delivery happens. So it's a completely peer-to-peer -peer and cloud to endpoint uh, delivery mechanism. One of the most important things is that it's a single window set service system. So you can log in, you can do the complete uh, sign up and manage your process for your DCP yourself. You don't need to uh, call any other human being, you can do it all online. And the important thing that we do is have a backend that manages the equipment that's in every data everywhere in the world. So that we know the right keys to send to the right data and if the data changes their equipment, keys are automatically regenerated. So you and our support team is always there 24-7 behind the scenes to take care of the problem so you don't have to worry about it. Uh, but thank you to all of the people who helped provide the data for this presentation. I wasn't able to 
go into too much detail on all of that because of time constraints. But thank you. Thank you, Sandeep. Uh, we have definitely a lot of questions for later how the cost is going to be factored in and the merger with here for movie uh, But let's go on to our talk. And I think you a wonderful presentation. I hope. So I'm here as a, as a film director in VR, expert in VR. I'm here as a film produ producer. I'm preparing a VR uh, series in co-production between France and India. I'm also here as an artistic, uh, direct, uh, artistic director and coach for Gonda Pierre. And we, we've just finished a workshop with uh, participants from the production workshop from the Film Bazaar, creating immersive experience out of this little camera you probably all know already, it's the 360 degree camera from Samsung. So I will explain you very briefly how we can, and I will show you how we can create those, those interactive uh, immersions. But first of all, I will uh, tell how important it is to understand that this new media is going to uh, bring new types of narration uh, because we are uh, we are going to to give user uh, new kinds of stories um, as far as the user is in the middle of the creation the form of the narration will change itself because the the user is going to be a character from the movie in itself so it will really change a lot of things uh, the first thing is we don't have a frame anymore, so we can't rely on the editing to uh, create uh, stories. So we are, that's, that's the reason why interactivity is really uh, appealing to me. So I will, I will show you how we can jump, so I'm jumping very quickly from a software to another. This is the Wanda software interface. So you see that uh, I will show you very simply. I have here a few videos uh, I made in, uh, in Mumbai uh, last week. Uh, so here I have a, a video called Daravi. Uh, so I take this video and basically I put it on my storyboard very simply. I have also another video called Versova Beach. Uh, or, or it's already on my yes. Verse of the Beach is already on my on my timeline. So I just need my third video, which is which has been made in an auto. So I need this video to come. Uh, I go back to my storyboard. I choose this video. I make it spherical, and I put it on my storyboard. So now I have three videos on my storyboard. I will show you how, very basically how I create some link between them. So I have this tool here. I create uh, a link between them. And I will make sure that you see that little, little black square, the little red square here is uh, what we call the old spot. So I will erase this one because this is no how I want to construct my my video. Um, control delete. Okay. Okay. So I want to enter with this first video. I want the user to be able to see my auto first. So I will design this as a set as a start of sequence. And so I will in this sequence I have so. You see, it's uh, it's recorded in a in a rickshaw. Um, I will need to create a link to both videos. So let's say that for this video, I'm taking, I'm going to choose that this hotspot goes in this mirror here, and in my, and I want also to create a link to verse of the beach video. 
And for this, I have another odd spot. I will put it on this other mirror of the of the ritual. Okay. So now let's see what is going on. I can do a quick save. I go back to my storyboard. And now I will show you exactly what will happen in a year when we give this video, this, this, those two, three videos to a user. So it's a simulation on Firefox. So I am in my rig show. Of course, I can, I can move around. No, sorry, I have clicked too much. I to, to, okay, go back to. I go back to my video. Okay. Okay. So you see, I can really look at around. So it's a simulation of, of what the user will see if he's looking all around in my video. And so I have two app spots, so I will click, click on them. So first one here, I click. And now I am in uh, Versovevich, so I can see all around what was in Versovevich. <laughs> it's, it's very immersive because you're really in the middle of it. You see that people are interacting with the camera. You see, you see dogs coming, you see, you see a lot of action happening. <laughs> Okay, so let let's see what I would have happened if I choose the other if I choose the other mirror. So I click on this mirror instead, and now I'm teleported in another place. So I've presented very briefly how uh, you can you can do it. So of course I can I can move here. I can see what was happening. I can see people. Okay, I have. I am exactly at my camera was exactly at the level of the eyes of people, so I really have the impression to be among them, actually. <coughs> and at, after a moment, people will start to behave like normal, and it will be uh, <coughs> like in reality, but with a, be a very good immersion uh, feeling. So basically, now the, interact the interactivity is very, is very slow, is very um, uh, simple. But of course, I can show you, I can show you what could become out of this. Okay. This is a type, the type of interaction we can create to do a more uh, long experience, like. Uh, sh this is a short film, but we can also do a 20 minutes, 40 minutes experience out of the, this technology. So this software is a Wanda VR uh, studio application. Uh, you can see from, uh, from 4 to 7 or 5 to 7, I'm not sure, uh, at the workshop of the 48 hours uh, uh, um, jam. You can see the result of what participants from the production workshop has, have built from this technology. And I would be very happy to, to let you know more about it. Do you do the session in the evening, right? from 5 to? Uh, from 5 to 7. I think I'm yeah. quite interested to see it in, uh, in person about how the experience is. But uh, I think it's a growing technology. I think it's at the initial stages right now. In your experience, like, where do you see it going in the next five years in terms of where we are technology, the practical application of it? Um, so the, the practical uh, uh, application uh, for this software could be could be of course used for a uh, for film director like me telling stories, but it also could be used for uh, tourism going from a place to another uh, with this kind of hotspot is very uh, interesting. Uh, actually, it could, be, it could be used for any um, media that wants to use 360 degree videos and that wants the user to have the power. Because that's what this technology is bringing to, uh, to users, is the possibility to go where
whatever you want and to do what you want. Yeah, right. So depending on uh, the imagination of a producer and a film director, uh, building a narration and uh, uh, interactive uh, interfaces with this technology could really uh, appeal the, the audience. Yeah, so I think uh, what you're asking is, uh, where is this going in the next five years? Uh, see, I think you know, globally you see the trends. Uh, and then you, know, you talk of any changes <coughs> and this reports or how those content is moving. I think we are mixed realities, uh, you know, augmented reality is becoming the top of the world, right? A lot of content is getting produced in this space. And um, exactly is the name of the game. Uh, so no more, you know, people wanted to be a passive content just to come and view it. They want to interact with it. And that's what Arnold is mentioning, that, uh, you know, this will become more and more interactive. And, and how this will come into it, uh, will be a question. And I think there's a new Spielberg movie also coming out, uh, exploring this. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I have a couple of questions about your production module and uh, how it can actually be implemented for an independent filmmaker. There is a basic version where you can actually maybe tone it down a bit. But it really brings a lot of discipline into when you make a film. I think the cost aspect is something that you can control a lot when you have that kind of information into what's going to happen in the next shoot. Uh, thoughts on how we can implement it? Yeah, sure. I was just thinking when Arnold was showing his beach video and the dogs were running in, uh, if you would have used my modules, the dogs would have been avoided. <laughs> Okay, um, so yeah, I think from a cost point of view, uh, yes, I mean, as I said, there are a lot of, uh, you know, leakages in the production, uh, you know, when you're doing the production itself, it's such a manual process today right? that you are bound to be, you know, uh, having some inefficiencies. Uh, there are areas which will get just not covered, right, because everybody is focused on uh, creating an output there. But the process of creating the output is what is not being focused on. So I think as a concept, we are focusing on the process of the production. And because we are optimizing that, you know, it will lead to some uh, efficiencies, right. which will lead to some cost, uh, you know, and I think uh, uh, we'll just open it up to the audience and... Uh, Hi, this is Manish. Uh, the question is to Mr. Amko. Uh, as filmmakers and producers, we are worried about piracy. But to operate, uh, I read as you said, no. Leakage is also a problem. Uh, like the one which happened to your firm, Game of Thorns. How do you address it? No. Have you done anything to address such leakages? So, piracy is a, is a you know, uh, as, as you heard in the last forum, uh, it's a reality. Like, there are hackers out there who are behind, uh, you know, platforms, they're constantly hitting the platforms trying to hack. So for organizations like ourselves, it's a day-to-day -day challenge. And it's not something that we have solved for once and we are done with it. Um, you know, we have to solve this every day, right? Uh, so just to give you an example, we employ, um, you know, a group of hackers who hack our own systems. And, and you know, we kind of, uh, you know, uh, try to fail-proof uh, that particular system there. So we attack uh, security or, you know, let's say, anti-piracy uh, in three ways, which is people processing security and systems, right? So we are ISO 27,000 mark, we are software certified, that's the systems part. But what happens when an employee in your organization who's uh, an employee with you for a long time, you know, he has or she has a malintention of leaking data, you know? Then you have to go to the people part. So system has nothing to do with it. Um, you know, process has nothing to do with it. But it's the person now, right? So the, the history which you're referring to falls in the domain of not a hack, but it falls down in the domain of a intention, intentious breach, right? Uh, so those guys are behind the jails, by the way. And they are kind of, it's a non medical one. So, you know, Indian cyber laws are very strict enough that these guys are put, put behind bars and they're not even bailed at the high court. Right? So coming to the issue of piracy, it's a very real issue. It's an issue which you know all content owners are facing and, and it's an issue which has to be dealt on a day to day basis. Yeah, I mean companies like ourselves, we focus a lot on this and a lot of investment goes into securing uh, our platforms. I think uh, even Cube has a couple of views on that in terms of the hardware that you develop during distribution. I think that's a 
key thing that kind of has to stand out, especially when it comes to theater release? Absolutely. Uh, we have a hardware security module, which is certified by the Federal Information Processing Standard. Uh, so it's unhackable and uh, it's physically secure. So if you want to hack it, the only way is to break it and then it uh, erases itself. That's the kind of security that is used in digital cinema and we use that for the cloud distribution as well. Because that's the only way today to uh, make something unhackable. I just want to share a quick uh, interesting fact. <laughs> so in the US there was a study done, uh, because you must have heard HBO hacks. Game of Thrones has been the most common, you know, leaked, uh, you know, let's say, episode across the globe. Right? Uh, the minute, I mean, a few days after this happened in India, uh, in Spain this was again uh, an issue which happened. So in the US, there was a study done, and they found that the maximum leakages happen either from a post-production or from the EA's desk of that particular production. Why? Because, you know, content has become digital. Enterprises have not. People still take the digital content in a USB or a CD or a hard drive and give it to someone to say, edit this or dub this or do this. So, you, they themselves do not know how many versions of their content exist in the system today. How do you control such a thing? We are going a bit on time, so uh, take one more question. <coughs> one more last question. Hello? Yeah. Uh, it's on the uh, view on Google. The app you are showing that like how it is available and when probably can use and what kind of condition you have to go through. Sure. So uh, this is a, you know, I'll be frank, this is a B2B application, right? It's meant for a sizable production workers who do this because they do this on a daily basis. Uh, having said that, this is a very modular part of the entire app. Uh, so, you know, anyone can come and license it and use the app. It's a cloud-based application. You don't need anything to be installed. You just need a browser and, and the app is good to go. And all you need is a mobile phone or an iPad and just install the app and then it's, it's good to use. The only thing you have to do is pay for the license fee of it uh, and then that's it. People like us, independent filmmakers. So, so you can use a mic? Independent filmmakers, how uh, they can use it. So for the filmmakers also, I mean when you're doing the production, right? Um, so in that process, you can actually go subscribe for it, right? And then use this application for your production process. Okay, but he, he was suggesting probably some uh, scale down thing probably should be available. In the he was thinking about the cost. Uh, yeah. which is something which we can take care of. Uh, you know, if, if as a concept you're fine, mm -hmm. uh, I think it's a matter of adopting it and then costs can be Great. So thank you everyone. I think uh, you guys had a wonderful session and uh, Sentil, Ranald and Ankur shared some really good points about where the technology is headed towards and uh, I think there's a lot of scope especially in uh, VR as well as the distribution and especially I think the cost is a major point that a lot of people are worried about and, and how we can reduce as, well, as long as the technology increases in terms of the reach. So great. Thank you everyone. Thank you everyone for being here.